intro here? Okay. Hello, everyone. I am Andy Anderson. My partner, Ike Allen, and I are the co-owners of Avaya University. Thank you so much, as always, for joining us. In this event, we are talking with incredible fellow experts. We're talking with therapists, psychologists, best-selling authors, and more, and they're here to provide you with tools and strategies, ultimately to help you experience greater happiness in your life, greater peace, joy, and fulfillment. Today, our guest is going to talk about how unprocessed shame can increase anxiety and depression in trauma survivors. So please welcome Lisa Ferentz. Hi there. Hello. <laughs> it's a <laughs> pleasure to be with you. Right back at you. I'm so excited to get into this topic. I think the topic of shame as it relates to anything is so important and so I think under talked about in the world that I'm, I'm so excited that you're, that you're wanting to talk about that. And I'm going to tell everyone a little bit about you first and all of your, your amazing accomplishments and, or at least a few of them, and then we'll get started. So for those of you who don't know Lisa, she is a recognized expert in the strengths-based depath pathologized, I practiced that a few times before we started, depathologized treatment of trauma. And she's been in private practice for over 35 years. She prevents work, presents workshops and keynote addresses nationally as well as internationally. She is a clinical consultant to practitioners and mental health agencies in the US, Canada, the UK, and Ireland. She has been an adjunct faculty member at several universities. And she's also the founder of the Ference Institute, which is now in its 13th year of providing continuing education and mental health to mental health professionals and graduating over, wow, 1,600 clinicians from her two certificate programs. So in 2009, she was also voted the Social Worker of the Year by the Maryland Society for Clinical Social Work. And she is also the author of many, many books. And there's so much more I could tell you about Lisa, but in the interest of time and getting into this topic, I think we should start. So so how about anxiety as it relates to trauma, since trauma is a big topic of your, of your work. So how does anxiety manifest specifically in trauma survivors? Great. So I think what might make sense is to first talk about my belief that trauma survivors kind of come into the work and into the world with their own DSM. You know, mental health providers have this huge <laughs> very uh, onerous DSM. And I think trauma survivors kind of have a very small version of a DSM as well. Uh, what I mean by that is the way they make sense out of their thoughts, their feelings, their behavioral choices is by coming to the conclusion that they are either broken, dirty, damaged, bad, weird, crazy, or abnormal. And that's kind of their DSM. And so I think it's important to recognize that that's the context that they're operating from. When we then add to that anxious feelings or an episode of depression, that's going to exacerbate that core belief of being flawed, of being damaged in some way. And I think it's also going to impact often the extent to which a client is willing to get the treatment, the support, the guidance, the help that they actually deserve and need because when you hate yourself, it resonates to hurt yourself. Um, and so when they struggle, which I think they inevitably do with feelings of anxiety and feelings of depression, and we can talk very specifically about the anxiety and depressed mood that I think is specific to trauma itself, um, you may, as a clinician, often feel more, quote, resistance. And I put the word resistance in quote because I don't actually believe in resistance as a concept. I think it's a form of pacing. I think it's a form of self-protection. But it can certainly can, it can create frustration and confusion for therapists when they don't feel that the client is being compliant around their suggestions to treat the anxious mood or the depressed state. Mm. Um, so does that make sense that we have yeah. to start with that context of their coming into the process with those, with those core feelings of worthlessness, which corrects us directly to shame, right? right. One, yeah. one question first, just to clarify something. So you said DSM in the beginning. And, and so while we have many therapists and, and um, clinicians that watch our events, we also do have people who are just struggling with anxiety and depression. So for okay. those people who are like, wait a second, what does DSM mean? Could you, could you clarify that? Cool. Sure, so the DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that mental health providers use that has this huge array of diagnoses in it, all kinds of criteria that we go by to 
frankly, kind of label, this is the mental health disorder that a client is struggling with. As you said in the beginning, Andy, my work is very strengths-based and depathologized, so uh, that's why I don't like DSM, because rather than focusing on what's wrong with my client, I really focus on what's right about them, their strengths, their resiliency. But DSM is a kind of universally used manual within the mental health field, so that we can kind of get a handle on what's sitting across from us. And then that's going to obviously inform the treatment that we, that we will engage in with mm -hmm. that client. Got it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to keep going with what you were talking about? Or do you want me to ask you the next question? I wasn't sure if you, you were done. You can ask me the next question. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so, so we touched on anxiety as it relates to trauma survivors. So what about people who are watching right now who are struggling with depression as it relates to um, being someone who has struggled with trauma in their past? Yeah. So let me also say this about anxiety. I like to make the distinction between anxiety and depression. I think anxiety is more about being lost and, and stuck in the future, meaning that clients often uh, spend a tremendous amount of energy kind of what ifing worst case scenarios that have actually not yet happened and often don't happen, right? Yeah. Um, but that's how I often define anxious feeling, that worry about what if this happens. Whereas depression, I think, is often about being lost or stuck in the past. Mm -hmm. So feelings of helplessness, hopelessness, disempowerment, often feelings of regret or loss. And for trauma survivors, depression, I think, is also very connected to unprocessed, unhealed traumatic experiences that they've not yet dealt with. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a kind of interesting paradigm that with anxiety, we're kind of future focused and oriented. And with depression, we're often kind of lost and stuck in the past. In either case, obviously what's missing is the client's capacity to be in the present moment, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're lost in either, either of those two places. Got it. Yeah. So I think um, when we talk about the, the sort of confluence, the relationship between anxiety, depression, and trauma, I think there are some specific reasons why trauma survivors experience anxiety. Mm -hmm. I think they can experience anxiety around um, not believing that their narrative is going to be believed. Uh, that fear about if I disclose what happened to me, uh, either nobody will believe me or I will be blamed for what happened. There's anxiety around why didn't I do something to stop it or prevent it. Um, there can be anxiety around witnessing abuse. When's it going to happen to me? Um, who can I tell? You know, how can I stop or prevent what's, what's happening here? Um, there's anxiety for a lot of my clients who are very high functioning people about what we often refer to as the imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. So they go through life you know, externally looking very successful, and they actually are very successful, but internally, because there's that sense of worthlessness, and here's where the shame comes in again, because there's that sense of worthlessness about themselves, there's tension around, um, anx anxiety around, I don't want anybody to find out that in actuality, I am those seven things that I believe I am, worthless and damaged, right? Dirty, bad, responsible for what happened. So there can be a lot of anxiety around that. Many of the trauma survivors I work with are often turning to self-destructive behaviors, so to self-medicate. Uh, to try to navigate and manage the overwhelming memories or the overwhelming emotion that's connected to their, their traumatic experiences. And they're anxious about doing their self-destructive behavior, whether that's an eating disorder, an addiction, uh, an act of self-mutilation. And they're also anxious about being found out, you know, by a loved one or by their therapist that they're still engaging in that behavior. Mm -hmm. So I think those are some of the things. The other thing I'll add about anxiety is that they think that change and transitions are particularly challenging for trauma survivors. And I think this is because change equals something bad is going to happen. That was very much their experience in childhood and in the past. And of course, life is filled with change and transition. And so there can be a kind of pervasive undercurrent of anxiety around managing and navigating those changes. And just when they feel like they've got a handle on a transition, the anxiety then is about the other shoe dropping. 
Because mm -hmm. that's a very common cognition, a very common thought for trauma survivors as well, that sooner or later, no matter how good things feel right now, sooner or later, the rug's going to be pulled out, the shoe's going to drop, you know, and I'm going to suddenly be untethered again and not know how to navigate. Mm -hmm. Now, I think all the things I just described also have relevance to depression. If I'm walking around with that sense of myself as worthless and bad, and I'm engaging in tremendous self-blame, which so many trauma survivors unfortunately do, believing that the abuse was their fault, mm -hmm. or they again should have prevented it or done something to stop it, that's depressing. And so that's going to exacerbate you know, that, that feeling of hopelessness and helplessness that they're walking around with they can experience an exacerbation or an increase in depression because they feel held hostage by their self-destructive behavior. Most of the clients I work with who are medicating with drugs and alcohol and cutting and eating disorder behavior, you know, there's a very big part of them that does not want to engage in that behavior. And it's depressing for them, you know, to feel like this, these are my only options. These are only my resources for comfort and for self-soothing. Mm -hmm. I also think trauma survivors have another mantra in life, which is getting close to other people uh, equals getting hurt. Right. And so, so many trauma survivors have both depression and anxiety around intimacy, right? Around allowing themselves to be vulnerable and to truly open up and trust another person. So they're anxious about being in an intimate relationship and really sustaining that relationship. They're anxious about assuming that sooner or later they're gonna be rejected or abandoned and that relationship is not gonna work out. And so often their antidote for that is to not allow themselves to be in an intimate relationship. They become very socially isolated and that then fuels their depression. Mm -hmm. So you can see how there's tremendous interplay between the anxiety and the depression. And I think the, the kind of the fuel that's underneath all of this is in fact shame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so can you say more about that? Like how, do, how does shame specifically exacerbate anxiety and exacerbate depression? Yeah. So let's make the distinction between shame and guilt. So guilt is often feeling badly because I've done something or I've said something that I regret or I didn't say something or I didn't do something that I should have or wanted to. But shame is different. Shame gets to the core of who I am as a person. Um, in that case, shame can feel intractable because if I go through life with this belief that I am fundamentally flawed, I am fundamentally bad, for so many clients who come into therapy, that feels like a hopeless scenario. And that hopelessness and that feeling of worthlessness and that core lack of self-esteem not only is going to fuel anxiety and depression, but it's also going to get in the way of compliance around treatment. Mm -hmm. Because um, all the things that therapists can offer their clients, whether it's medication, which can be incredibly helpful, you know, to help ma manage and, and treat depression or anxiety, or the non-pharmacological, the non-medicine the non approaches that therapists can offer, whether that's aromatherapy, music, exercise, volunteer work, guided imagery, mindfulness, um, interacting with the pet. There are many things that therapists can offer clients that are not connected to medication, but when you're holding from that core sense of shame, it's not going to resonate to want to put into practice those acts of self-love and self-care. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to kind of, I think, create this this stuckness, right, that so many clients experience around their depression, around their anxiety. So this is kind of a long-winded way of saying that, although of course it's essential for mental health providers to treat and to talk about depressed mood and anxious mood, I think that unless we go deeper and really begin to explore those core feelings of shame, those core feelings of work, worthlessness, and begin to bring into the therapy process what I believe are the antidotes to shame, we often don't get very far around the treatment of the anxiety and the depression, if that makes mm. sense. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And I could see that being like a really, it's like, right? If one is feeling so not good enough and so bad about themselves, then how how do we help them come to you or come to one of our other speakers or whatever to get the help that they need? And maybe that's listening to this or watching this right now, but like, how do we, how do they break through that initial piece to get help? 
Yeah. So the two things that I think really are the antidotes to shame that certainly can be addressed in therapy, but also to your point could be in some ways explored outside of therapy on their own. And maybe that these become kind of the entryway into believing that they are worthy of uh, the support of a therapeutic relationship. And they're worthy of the interventions that mental health providers can offer them. So the two antidotes that we can touch on are both curiosity and self-compassion. Mm. Um, so I'll just maybe kind of talk mm -hmm. a little bit about both of those things. Yeah. With you. So I think with curiosity, because so many trauma survivors hold this core belief that they're responsible for what happened in their families of origin and, and that they should have prevented it and, and that they should have somehow stopped it. When we can introduce the concept of curiosity, what we do is create this little bit of opening, this little bit of space for the client to sit with the possibility that maybe what happened was not their fault. Mm -hmm. That maybe what happened and often there's a chronicity to what happened, right? We're, we're often talking about people who've experienced throughout their entire childhood abuse, neglect, um, you know, trying to navigate parents who have addiction issues, parents who have their own undiagnosed and untreated depression, um, you know, many ways in which dysfunction can manifest in a family. But when we allow ourselves that little bit of opening, that little bit of possibility, that maybe I was not responsible. Maybe um, I was kind of caught in the crosshairs of a lot of dysfunctional family dynamics. And that maybe as a child, the reality is there was nothing I could have done to stop or to prevent what was happening, which, you know, as adults, we know clearly is the case. But it's amazing, Andy, how many adult trauma survivors have never allowed for that possibility, you know, to right. enter in, into their mindset. So allowing for that curiosity, um, you know, the possibility that, that those seven diagnoses of bad, damaged, weird, crazy, abnormal, maybe that's not who they are. Maybe it's not I am bad, but rather bad things happen to me. Mm -hmm. Maybe rather than traumatic experience or an episode of anxiety or an episode of generalized anxiety or an episode of depression, maybe... The difference here is that, yes, it impacts my life and it informs my life, but it doesn't have to define my sense of self. There's a huge difference, and I'm sure you can hear this right away. There's a huge difference between saying I'm experiencing a depressive episode versus I am depressed. Right. Right. I'm doing anxiety versus I am anxious. Mm-hmm. Right. And those shifts, you know, it might just sound like semantics, but those shifts in the way we think about our experiences, the meaning that we attach to our experiences, it's profound. Mm -hmm. And it, that opening of, you know, maybe the way I've been thinking about my trauma, I've been thinking about depression and I've been thinking about anxiety, maybe there's another way to think about that. So mm -hmm. that cre can create a very powerful opening. And if we can pique enough curiosity, I find as a therapist, that's what c helps people to kind of lean in and, you know, and want to learn more. Even if, it, and even if that curiosity initially can, creates confusion, right? Like, wait, what, what, what do you mean it wasn't my fault? What, what, wait, what? I, what do you mean? Of course it's my fault. Um, I like kind of creating that disequilibrium because what we know as mental health providers is that change never occurs in homeostasis. When things are constant and rigid and the same, change doesn't occur. Mm -hmm. So creating that confusion, not to be sadistic about it, but creating that little bit of confusion um, piques curiosity. And if you think about it, curiosity by definition forces us to be open-minded. When we're critical and, and judgmental, we're closed-minded mm -hmm. and we have a kind of narrow mindset. But curiosity creates an opening and an open-mindedness. Um, and sometimes that's the thing that bring, brings people into therapy. Right. Mm -hmm. So curiosity is, a, I think, a big piece to the puzzle. And I think the second thing, as I alluded to, is self-compassion. Um, kind of this shift from self-blame to really allowing for the feelings of empathy around, wow, I've been through a lot and I'm still standing. Right. And let me, be, let me start to look at 
Like, why am I still standing? What are the things about me that have allowed me to still be here despite and because of everything that I've been through? Mm -hmm. And that creates an exploration of resiliency and creativity, um, inner resourcing, right? Now, self-compassion is really, really tricky because as I said before, if you spend a lifetime hating yourself, the idea of talking to yourself with loving kindness is going to feel very alien. Mm -hmm. This is where therapy is really, really essential because in the course of a therapy session, I have clients who can say incredibly mean things about themselves 50 times, right? You know, this is going to be really stupid or, you know, I know what I'm about to say makes no sense or I really hate this about myself. This is where I believe a therapist's job is to put their hand up and to pause the work and to really gently call to the attention of the client, um, hang on, is there a kinder, gentler way that you could say that? Mm -hmm. Because mostly trauma survivors, it, it's so habituated to talk to themselves, you know, with self-loathing that they're not even consciously aware of all the subtle and not so subtle ways that they, they're critical, they're judgmental, they beat themselves up, they're blaming, they never cut themselves any slack, and yet they can be incredibly kind to other people. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we kind of look at that double standard in therapy. And, you know, I'll often ask a client, you know, if you had a best friend who shared with you that same trauma experience, would you look her in the eye and say, listen, I need you to know that everything that happened was your fault. Right. Right. And, and the client like kind of instantly said, of course not. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what would you say? You know, what would you say to somebody you love, a best friend? your own child, what would you say, you know, if they shared with you a traumatic experience or if they came to you and said that they were feeling anxious or they were feeling depressed, you know, would you kick them? Would you blame them? Would you make them feel worse about it? Would you shame them for it? Um, you know, and when you kind of put it in that perspective, it's very easy for clients to realize, no, I'd be supportive, I'd be loving, I'd be patient, mm -hmm. you know, I'd be kind, I'd, I'd ask, what can I do to help you, you know? Um, I'd give them a sense of hope, you know? This is time limited, don't worry, things can get better for you. So that's kind of the narrative and the language that we want to encourage clients to begin to bring to themselves. In one of my books, I talk about this idea. That I think there's nothing more powerful than the way we talk to ourselves about ourselves. Mm -hmm. So for, for those, you know, those of you who are listening, who have never been in therapy and, you know, maybe you're reticent about being therapy, I would try to empower you to at least start there. Begin to notice how you talk to yourself about yourself mm -hmm. and when you consciously become aware that you're talking to yourself in a way that is critical that is judgmental that is shaming see if you can pause see if you can take a half a step back and just ask yourself is there a kinder way that i could say that and if you can't come up with a kinder way i'm going to give you a couple of other quick strategies that you can use um, think about somebody else in your life who really loves you and cares about you. Maybe it was your grandmother. Maybe it was your third grade math teacher. And ask yourself, how would my grandmother say that to me? Mm -hmm. Right? Kind of bringing in that resource from the, from the past. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that that's a, a way to start. And boy, can that help to reduce the sense of shame that people feel. And once we've begun to really address and work with the shame, what I find is that clients are way more open and willing to then more directly target and treat the anxiety and the depression. Mm, so those things that. really, really go hand in hand. Mm, thank you. Curiosity and self-compassion. I, you know, one of the things, there's a couple things, right? When you talked about self-compassion, I, I so like got the chills when you said, you know, the whole thing about, well, wait a second, if your friend had just told you, right, this happened to them when they were young, would you be like, well, hey, it's your fault, right? Like it's so like, I mean, it, it seems kind of so obvious when you say it like that, but then yeah, it just creates this whole shift in how we talk to ourselves because of course not. That's like, we would never say such a thing to our friend, right? Like we'd be there for them. We'd be holding their hand. We would be, you know, loving them and helping them and, and absolutely being able to treat ourselves in that same way. The second thing is when you talked about the curiosity is the disidentification, right? With anxiety, depression, 
like by not you by changing your language around it. I'm I am not depressed. I am being depressed or acting or whatever, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's experiencing it. Do I uh, Bill O'Hanlon years ago in solution focused therapy and I learned that from him and it just always stayed with me. I'm doing depression. Yeah. It's so different from saying I am depressed because again that becomes kind of an all encompassing sense of identity which so narrows our sense of ourself and it narrows our mindset and it eliminates, I think that sense of hope and possibility. Um, hope and possibility are things that therapists often can contribute to, to the work. And that's why it's, it's, it's such a gift, frankly, to allow yourself to seek the support um, and to get the help that you deserve. I don't say to my clients, uh, it's, you know, you need help. I say you deserve help. You deserve that support. Mm -hmm. And again, if we bring this full circle, Andy, to trauma survivors, one of the major components of trauma is that it's very isolating and that most kids and teenagers, as they're traumatized, are so alone in their trauma. Right. And we've had that experience over and over and over again. It's actually hard to realize and to imagine that you can reach out to another human being and get the support and the guidance and the education and the cheerleading that you deserve and need to navigate depressed mood or anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, so I get why it feels counterintuitive for somebody who has a longstanding history of trauma, who's been very isolated, who's kind of was forced to become very self-reliant in the way they navigate life and all of their emotions, you know, to, to believe and to buy into the idea you don't have to walk this walk alone. You don't have to take this journey towards healing by yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's so reparative when you can allow for, yes, the vulnerability of letting another person in. Um, the work unfolds, frankly, so much more quickly. Mm -hmm. And there can be real joy in allowing for that intimacy and that closeness. We, I talked earlier about the anxiety that, that so many trauma survivors feel about allowing for closeness and connection. Well, the safest person that you can try out emotional intimacy with is a therapist. Mm -hmm. right. you know? mm -hmm. That's your best shot at somebody who's gonna be unconditional and non-judgmental. Um, it's the only relationship, when you think about it, where two people are totally focused on one person, the client. Right. right? Yes. The therapeutic experience is not about the therapist. You, mm -hmm. The client never has to take care of the therapist. It's mm -hmm. all about two people focusing on the client. Mm -hmm. And that can feel very reparative and healing for somebody who's been neglected, who's not gotten the secure attachment that they deserve to have growing up. Mm -hmm. So there's so much uh, loving repair that happens in the course of good therapy with a well-trained clinician. Mm, I love it. Yeah, the the power of community. I mean, I'm always so just dazzled by the events that we do because I mean, right, everyone watching right now just know that there are like thousands of other people watching who have come from very, no one has the same right childhood or story or unique scenario that you have, but so many people have something similar or or whatever. You are so not alone. It's, you know, so many people, whether we like tell ourselves, oh, I'm the only one that, you know, has had such horrible things happen. You're not, you're just not. And there are so many people out there to help support you. And, and I just appreciate you and, and, and sharing that, Lisa. Thank you. I love the work that you're doing. And, and this idea of really letting people know that they're not alone in their pain and they're not alone in their experiences, um, normalizing that, universalizing that, that often can be the first step towards people seeking the help that they deserve. So I, I love that you're you know, really highlighting that idea. Mm, well, thank you for all of that. And everyone, I highly recommend you go check out Lisa's site for all of that good stuff. And, and thank you for doing this. You have a very just loving, peaceful essence about you. And I, I've really enjoyed this. Are, are there any last insights? Anything else you feel like we should let everyone know before we wrap up? You know, um, and thank you for such kind words. You have that same really wonderful, loving presence. So I think we're, now we're, we're new best friends. That's we're right. <laughs> um, you know, I think the parting thing that I always like to leave people with whenever I do, you know, a webinar like this is, is just to leave them with a sense of hope that 
uh, you know, no matter how profound the pain is and no matter how chronic the abuse may have been, and that this is not in any way to, to minimize that pain or those experiences. What I can tell you, having been a trauma therapist for 36 years and having been able to witness just remarkable healing journeys in people from all walks of life, men, women, teenagers, you know, huge range of ages, huge range of life experiences, just to let your listening audience really know and hear that healing is absolutely possible. Mm -hmm. and, and just know that when you come into the process, if you don't have a lot of hope, your therapist will hold the hope for you. And you can, I always tell my clients, you can lean on and you can borrow my hope until you can access the part of you that has it within you. Mm. So um, just know that you absolutely can heal. Mm, I get the chills. Thank you. That was beautiful. I appreciate it. Thank you for doing this, Lisa. I really appreciate you and all your amazing work. And thank you everyone for tuning in, for showing up for yourself, for, for being curious, for being self-compassionate and, and loving yourself. So thanks so much for tuning in and we'll see you on the next one. Take care, everybody. Yay. You're awesome. Oh my God. You made that so easy. <laughs> hey everyone. I just wrapped up another beautiful class with Lisa Ferentz. She talked with us about how unprocessed shame can increase anxiety and depression in trauma survivors. So, oh my gosh, I loved her. I love Lisa. I love her work. I love how she takes right anxiety and depression and interweaves it obviously with trauma if you've experienced any childhood trauma or trauma from your past as well as weaving it into this topic of shame and talking about how shame can obviously influence your ability to heal from anxiety and depression to heal from trauma so we talked about many things one of the things we talked about was how anxiety manifests specifically in trauma survivors so she talked about it being like feeling lost and stuck in the future, right? Being stuck in your mind of what if, what if this happens, what if that happens, and not, not necessarily happy, positive things that are gonna happen, but those worst case scenarios, those things that make you worry and get you all anxious and, um, and all of those things. So that is really how anxiety manifests in trauma survivors. Also, she talked about people feeling um, anxiety when you have a fear of talking about your trauma. You might think that people won't believe you. You might start blaming yourself or you might you know be worried that people will blame you for what happened all of those kinds of things can create anxiety and then she also talked about how depression manifests in trauma survivors and that is being lost and stuck in the past right in these feelings and thoughts of helplessness and hopelessness and regret and loss and oftentimes she also mentioned that if you are a trauma survivor and you haven't processed or healed Right, these traumatic experiences in your life, this can lead to depression because of a lot of um, emotions and things that have been stuffed down and not processed, not healed, and you haven't actually you know, gone through the steps in order to heal that in your life so it can create the depression. So a couple of antidotes she talked about to shame because again, shame can be this right thing that can actually stop us from healing from anxiety and depression, can stop us from potentially getting help for anxiety and depression. So if that's you watching right now, if you have shame around actually reaching out to get a therapist, reaching out to get help in, in ways that right, make you vulnerable in group settings or, or just talking to a therapist, just know that there are antidotes to shame and hopefully these things can help you get to the point of asking for help and, and, and seeing a therapist if that's the, the right thing for you to do. So these two antidotes she talked about are curiosity and self-compassion. Right, so allowing yourself to get curious. Maybe you beat yourself up for whatever happened to you in the past. What if you were to get curious and start exploring, well, maybe I'm not bad, right? Maybe I'm not not good enough. Maybe I am good enough. Maybe I'm awesome. Maybe I am this amazing person, but I keep telling myself that because of the bad things that happened to me, I am not good enough. So maybe bad things did happen to you, but it doesn't have to define your sense of self. So really, really powerful stuff that Lisa talked with us about. Um, secondly, again, is that self-compassion, right? Recognize like, wow, like I have been through all of these things in my life, my childhood, my past, Lots of challenging things have happened to me in my life. So, wow, I have actually come through those and here I am. I'm still standing, right? Give yourself some credit 
for being where you are today, given all the stuff that's happened in your life. So just awesome things. I really, really connected well with Lisa and I hope that you did too. I feel like she is such a compassionate, loving person and I highly recommend you check out her work further if you're interested in working with her, checking out her eBooks, her work, all of that kind of stuff. Again, the links for those are below and just the last thing I wanted to mention was one other thing Lisa said, which was creating change doesn't happen in homeostasis, right? When things are the same and aren't change and are just always staying the same, same in homeostasis, right? Change doesn't happen. So this might be the opportunity for you to step outside of that homeostasis, that routine, that comfort zone that you've become accustomed to and allow yourself to be vulnerable, to open up to curiosity, to open up to self-compassion. All right. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you on the next one. Take care. Mm -hmm.